Hello, I hope you're having a great day. My name is Nathan Brummel, and today I want to talk to you about Rousseau, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, and some of his public theology. I was introduced to Rousseau's thought in a deeper way when I had a graduate seminar at the University of Wisconsin in which we read Emile and his various political writings. And one thing that has struck me is how in the 20th century and in the 21st century, there are people who are secularists who are drawing on Rousseau's thought. And so I experienced too at the University of Wisconsin that I had fellow students, graduate students in the philosophy department who are atheists. They were very secular and evolutionary in their thought. And yet Rousseau appealed to them and Rousseau appealed to their development of a political theology or an, a political atheology. And uh, my reflections on Rousseau, though, don't find that he's very supportive of a secularist approach to politics and the general will. Now, what is found in Rousseau is a very positive view of human nature, the whole idea that humans get corrupted by being in society, and also the idea of a general will, a general will that stands behind what happens in the political arena a supposed general will by which the population, the individuals in a certain population will make choices that are for the benefit of all. So it's a very optimistic view of human nature and citizens. But I want to point out that there are internal inconsistencies when secularists and atheists or evolutionists try to take Rousseau's thought and then to develop it for the present within their paradigms. I want to show that there are serious inconsistencies. In fact, it really can't be done. Now, there are problems in his idea of the general will, and that's something that I will look at at a different time. But now I want to call attention to Rousseau's view of the conscience. Now, there's something about Rousseau's view of the conscience, as we will see, that is connected to the Christian tradition. And therein is a problem, of course, for evolutionary atheists, who try to repristinate Rousseau's thought because we're going to see that Rousseau's thought is based on really what we could call a natural theology or a theology of a conscience embedded in every human being. So we're going to look at the whole topic of conscience in the thought of Rousseau. Now Rousseau in Emile says this, and notice the way in which he talks about the conscience. Conscience, conscience, divine instinct, immortal and celestial voice, certain guide of a being that is ignorant and limited, but intelligent and free, infallible judge of good and bad, which makes man like unto God. It is you who make the excellence of his nature and the morality of his actions. Without your sense, nothing in me raises me above the beasts other than the sad privilege of leading myself astray from error to error with the aid of an understanding without rule and a reason without principle. That's what Rousseau says in Emile. And so you can see that he talks about conscience in a very poetic way. He, he glorifies conscience. And conscience plays many roles in Rousseau's thought. It is an argument for the existence of God. It is the celestial voice, he says, in humans that causes them to know what is just. It works together with reason to cause love of the good and hatred of the evil. In fact, happiness is defined as involving health, strength, and most importantly, a good conscience, which is something that Ellis points out in Rousseau's thought. Now, what is the conscience in Rousseau's thought, and what place does it play in his moral and political thought? And we will see that it plays a very crucial role. I will also look at some objections that Rousseau considers to his theory of conscience and then why he rejects them. Now, the conscience, according to Rousseau, is a faculty that exists in the soul. And this is very similar to what you find, of course, in the Christian tradition. It, as Ellis states in Rousseau, utters the dictates of wisdom in the secret places of the soul. So for Rousseau, the conscience is a faculty that God created in humans where he puts innate wisdom. 
The conscience was created with various functions. Uh, Rousseau believes it's not only a moral guide, but also a guide of the intellect and what is beautiful. Rousseau follows the Christian tradition in claiming that the conscience is a source of right and wrong. But he departs from this tradition with his claims about conscience being a guide for the beautiful. He also seems to think that the intellect receives guidance from the conscience about truths that are not about morality. Now, if this is his position, then he is putting more content into the concept of conscience than the Christian tradition has done. He includes the idea of beauty and then also truths that traditionally would not have been perceived as being grounded in the conscience. Now, of course, in the Christian tradition, we have also taught that man in his conscience or in his heart has a sense of divinity. And so when every man goes outside on a beautiful day and sees the glory of God, he knows that God exists. So there is a resonance, a resonance, an echo uh, in man's soul about the existence and even the power and Godhead of God. But that's not what Rousseau was talking about. But Rousseau emphasizes the importance of the conscience. For him, this faculty lifts humans above the state of beasts. And that, once again, is something that the Christian tradition taught. Rousseau says, Conscience, conscience, divine instinct, celestial and immortal voice, the certain guide of a being who, though limited and ignorant, is intelligent and free, infallible judge of good and evil, Sublime emanation from the everlasting substance which makes man resemble God. It is you alone that makes whatever is fine in my nature. For Rousseau, the conscience is the faculty that makes humans the special creatures that they are. And that is, of course, the same thing in the Christian tradition. Man's sense of divinity and his conscience are things that make up man in the image of God in the wider sense. Also, the rationality of man is dependent on conscience. That's something that's important for Rousseau. Now, notice, of course, there's a problem with taking Rousseau's ideas there with, into the paradigm of atheism and secularism and evolutionary thought if the rationality of man is dependent on conscience. Now, Madeleine Ellis, in a book entitled Rousseau's Socratic A Million Myths, describes how Rousseau believes that rationality is dependent on conscience. She says, Without that light, which is the light of moral truth, the rational power in social man is lost, in Rousseau's Socratic view. Rousseau makes the traditional Christian distinction between the heart and the mind, even. He claims that the rationality is to the mind as the conscience is to the heart. Now, there's an interesting relation between conscience and reason in Rousseau's thought. In some ways, there might be said to be a gray area in the distinction he gives between reason and conscience. The problem is that the conscience somehow contains a knowledge of right and wrong, but only reason can teach us the good. He says, reason alone teaches us to know good and bad. Conscience, which makes us love the former and hate the latter, although independent of reason, cannot therefore be developed without it. Before the age of reason, we do good and bad without knowing it, and there is no morality in our actions, Rousseau claims. So, according to him, conscience and reason work together to produce knowledge of the good. Now, it's not clear what can be meant by reason for this claim of Rousseau to make sense. Does he mean by reason just consciousness? For it doesn't seem that reason should be defined as just consciousness. Rather, reason is the faculty of abstract thought. But contra Rousseau, it seems possible that humans might have some knowledge of right and wrong that comes from their simple consciousness of a situation combined with their conscience. It's not clear why an added faculty of reason is needed to produce knowledge of the good. Maybe it's just that Rousseau is combining the concept of reason with any type of consciousness and logical thinking. He lays out the difference, though, between conscience reason, and liberty by putting these words in the mouth of the Saviour Vicar in his book Emile. He said, Did God not give me conscience for loving the good, reason for knowing it, and liberty for choosing it? 
Following St. Augustine, among others, Rousseau defines freedom in terms of freely choosing to keep the laws of God. He says, but the eternal laws of nature and order do exist. For the wise man, they take the place of positive law. They are written in the depth of his heart by conscience and reason. It is to these that he ought to enslave himself in order to be free. The only slave is the man who does evil, for he always does it in spite of himself. Freedom is found in no form of government. It is in the heart of the free man. Now, what is striking here, of course, is that Rousseau is using concepts from the history of Christianity. And there is, in his thought, a sort of theology behind the scenes, even though no one is going to claim that Rousseau is an evangelical Protestant. But there are problems here when you try to take someone who has a whole worldview and philosophy built upon a sort of theology like this and then try to secularize it. Now, according to Rousseau, the conscience provides the mind with the knowledge of the good so that the person can choose to be free. In Emile, Rousseau says, uh, speaking of the need to introduce Emile toward the end of adolescence to the immorality of the world, he says, I would try to show how the first voices of conscience arise out of the first movements of the heart and how the first notions of good and bad are born of the sentiments of love and hate. I would show that justice and goodness are true affections of the soul, enlightened by reason, and hence only an ordered development of our primitive affections. That by reason alone, independent of conscience, no natural law can be established, and that the entire right of nature, if only a chimera, if it is not, or chimera, if it is not founded on a natural need in the human heart. So the tutor, who is Rousseau, will take a meal on a tour of the world to show him that although humans are naturally good, yet society perverts them. So notice that's his basic argument, that somehow humans have a conscience and naturally left to themselves would have a sense of right and wrong and do what is good. But the problem is, is that society is the problem and society corrupts. So of course here he is not Augustinian in his anthropology. He is Pelagian in his anthropology in the sense that he thinks that humans are born basically good. Now, Rousseau thinks that natural law is revealed to humans by the feelings of conscience. Natural law does not receive its status from human societies, which are filled with every injustice. Rather, it gets its worth from the sentiments of the heart. That is why, in a meal, Rousseau has the Savoyard Vicar consider an objection that's made to the idea that the conscience is always good and pure, which is Rousseau's view. The Savoyard Vicar states that any claim that the conscience is the work of prejudices is wrong. Now, by prejudices, he means that the sentiments of the conscience originate from society. Since society is filled with many evils, where society is biased towards evil, some of the humans in that society will have a conscience that's also biased. Now, he responds to this by saying that his experience teaches him that the laws of nature that come from the conscience are always against all the laws of men. Now, that's a strong statement. Later, the Vicar says that if the conscience does contain prejudices, then there cannot be any morality. Notice his argument. For there would be no difference in good and bad, since they would both proceed from the human conscience. So he says there can't be this internal inconsistency in the conscience. It can't be part good, part bad. It has to be all good if it's going to direct human moral behavior. Rousseau is assuming that what is the original nature of humans is determines the way that they should be. So if humans are innately good, and if they were evil as well, then it would be all right for them to be both. So, for example, what he's saying is that if humans are able to do good and bad and their conscience somehow uh, reflects that, then it would be okay for them to do good and bad both. The Vicar thinks that two things militate against the conscience having prejudices. First, humans have the natural inclination to seek their own personal happiness. And then second, he says they have a strong innate idea of justice. And these together convince him that happiness is to be found in justice. Now, in support of this, Rousseau argues that if you're going to claim that the conscience has prejudices, then you must claim that it is contrary to nature to be good, at least in many cases. 
He thinks everyone will agree that they are happier after having done something good than when they do something evil. Now, it is no objection to his view of conscience that certain countries have bizarre social practices. Um, and just because there's disagreement over some strange customs, Rousseau doesn't think there's sufficient grounds to reject the idea of a universal conscience, because he asks, can you tell me whether there is some country on earth where it is a crime to keep one's faith, to be clement, beneficent, and generous, where the good man is contemptible and the perfidious are honored? Well, that's actually uh, quite the rhetorical question, because in the 20th century, of course, we have seen a Soviet Union, and we have seen also a communist China, where, in fact, those are the kind of things that were honored. To be perfidious, to be deceptive, were actually honored. But uh, Rousseau thinks that those who think the conscience has prejudices claim that the conscience is subjective. And Rousseau wants nothing to do that. He doesn't want a subjective conscience. He wants the moral senses that come from the conscience to have an objective status because they were put there by God. The judgments of conscience are therefore always on the side of justice, Rousseau argues. Hence, he uh, infers that justice suits the nature of man and reflects a health in the soul of man, Ellis says about Rousseau. This means that the reason why humans seek after justice is not primarily for the good of others. The cause of doing good is self-love, for nature has ordained that personal happiness comes when one remains true to their own nature, and this is done by following conscience. Now this reminds me how Jesus does say we're to love our neighbor as ourselves, so there is, going to, there is to be proper love of our own souls and our own welfare too. And it's true that as we seek Christ, we are seeking, in fact, our highest and best interests. But Rousseau here, notice, he, he follows Christian theology in making a distinction between the desire to do good and the desire to do evil. Christianity has insisted on an internal battle occurring between two elements of the person, especially the Christian, the old and the new man. And Rousseau defines this in terms of the voice of the soul desiring to do good versus the law of the body desiring to do evil. He thinks that humans are free as long as the voice of the soul is raised against the law of the body. So this sounds a lot like, of course, the Pauline distinction between the old man and the new man. Now Rousseau qualifies what our conscience actually accomplishes in us, for he does not mean to claim that it can cause us to avoid all temptations. What is forbidden to us by conscience, Rousseau says, is not temptations, but rather letting ourselves be conquered by temptations. He thinks it's within our control to reign over them. So here he comes out as a Pelagian again. He says that all the sentiments we dominate are legitimate. All those which dominated us are criminal. So it will be the case that people at times do fall victim to temptation, but he thinks that they can dominate them in the long run. And so Rousseau is, once again, highly optimistic about fallen human nature. So Rousseau, you can see, is, is some sense on the same page as modern atheists and evolutionists who seem to have a very positive, optimistic view of human nature. In other words, many evolutionists today, you would say, are Pelagian in their anthropology, and Rousseau is as well. But what we find in Rousseau is also a, really, a theology of sorts. He presents a theodicy based on God giving humans an ability to will what they want. He thinks that God made humans with a free will and the ability, therefore, to sin because he wanted them to be like him and able to be free, good, and happy. So, see, this is a problem for the atheist because Rousseau talks like this. He talks about God as the creator. And, of course, in our universities today, even the idea of there being design in the universe is something that is anathema. So Rousseau argues that the conscience shouldn't be looked at as a negative thing that holds people back from doing evil things that might give them gratification. It's rather an intrinsic part of the free essence of humans that gives them the ability to freely choose the good. 
but the conscience is also an argument for the existence of God. Rousseau thinks that from this faculty we're led to infer that a just God exists who approves and disapproves of humans. Ellis points this out. And so this is very similar to an argument from design, but here instead we would say the design of the human conscience and its sense of right and wrong originates in a God, of course, who has a sense of justice. So Rousseau is teaching that humans have a faculty that is designed to produce certain effects in the area of morality. And if we have a conscience, then Rousseau's argument is that there must be a creator or designer of this conscience, of course, who possesses this type of morality. So this brings Rousseau to the inference that the soul must be immortal. And of course, this is anathema to the evolutionists as well. They want to argue that humans beings, their mind is basically somehow uh, equivalent with whatever sort of chemical and biological functions are happening in the human brain. He realizes that many times the just people lose out in this world while the unjust grow rich and powerful. And he argues that since our conscience tells us that the just will be happy and they're not always happy in this world, then it must be that after death they will be rewarded. Therefore, he argues there is reason to believe in the immortality of the soul. In heaven we are delivered from all that terrifying apparatus of philosophy. We can be men without being scholars. I think what he's saying is that we don't have to be philosophers of ethics to know what's right and wrong. He says his point is that every human being has a conscience. He says dispense from consuming our life in the study of morality. We have at less expense a more certain guide in this immense maze of human opinion. So notice here he does away with the philosophers who have all these elaborate arguments about what should motivate us to choose what is right or what is good. He says every human has a conscience. And so Rousseau says that Emile should follow the truth that he senses in his own soul, and he should not care what society thinks about him. If Emile might be put into a situation where he is to lecture or speak to other men, he should, Rousseau says, never speak to them except according to his conscience and without worrying whether they will applaud him or not. Rousseau also worries that reason will mislead Emile. Philosophy with its complexities can deceive, Rousseau is concerned about. He says the sure way to know truth and to know what is worth studying or knowing is to follow your conscience. So notice there's a mistrust of a rationality that's detached from the conscience. He thinks that you should trust in the innate simplicity of truth. Rousseau says, always remain firm in the path of truth or what is in the simplicity of your heart if it appears to be the truth. So various concepts in Rousseau's thought are intertwined with that of the conscience. For example, and this has great, great significance for his concept of the general will, which has played a very important role in political philosophy in the last couple of hundred years. For him, the general will is also dependent for its existence on humans having a conscience. Yes, having a conscience. The conscience that individual humans have is the original source of a general will that is sure and infallible. So notice how he grounds his concept, his political concept of a general will among the citizens and a population in his idea of the conscience. So, so Rousseau must think that it is self-evident to each person that they have a conscience and that it is designed like he thinks it is. He was very much influenced, as you can see, by the Christian tradition. But to a modern atheist, it is not clear that Rousseau has really made a good argument, for he is inferring from his personal desire for justice and goodness that all humans have the same desire. He also is assuming that God exists and God has created man with a conscience. Now, throughout history, uh, also we know that many people have loved injustice and done a lot that is evil. And so to modern atheists, yes, they go back and forth. On the one hand, they see to imply that humans are basically good. On the other hand, they also see the strong desire for evil. 
why should uh, we not infer that the conscience has both good and bad parts to it from an atheistic evolutionary perspective? How in the world can you argue that the conscience somehow evolved in humans, if you're an evolutionist, in such a way that everything that the conscience wants to affirm as right and good and true is actually right and good and true? What are the possibilities of that? In fact, when seeing all the evil around, why should we think that the conscience is pure and good? In fact, especially if humans have evolved due to natural selection and due to sharp teeth and strong claws. So contemporary atheists will have a difficult time defending Rousseau's political thought and developing a political thought based on it because it depends on his moral thought. It's hard to think of what a convincing evolutionary argument for humans being innately good might be. And even if one could come up with such an argument, there would still be the problem of arguing that just because at one stage in evolution humans were good, therefore they should be good at other stages. Rousseau thinks that if one abandons the idea of an author of the human moral conscience, then men will only be unjust hypocrites and liars. Let me say that again. He says if you abandon the belief in the author of the human moral conscience, men will only be unjust hypocrites and liars. He thinks that people who do not believe in God as the author of the conscience of humans will seek only private interests which in case of conflict necessarily prevails over everything, he says, and he says and teaches everyone to adorn vice with the mask of virtue. So notice Rousseau argues that if you reject the fact that God exists and that he's created humans with a conscience of right and wrong, the result is going to be evil. He claims that every unbeliever reasons in the following way. Let all other men do what is good for me at their expense. Let everything be related to me alone. Let all mankind, if need be, die in suffering and poverty to spare me a moment of pain or hunger. And there I hear Stalin speaking. I hear Hitler. I hear many selfish people. Rousseau concludes that the only way to have a moral society is to have one that believes in God and follows after the moral conscience that the society believes God has implanted in their hearts. So in conclusion, we have shown that Rousseau's theory of conscience involves an innate faculty of the heart that guides a person towards what is good and he thinks beautiful and wise. And this faculty plays a role in the development of his various theories. He claims that the conscience is proof for the existence of God and the immortality of of the soul. Finally, he thinks that if one rejects the idea of a conscience, then there will be no true morality. And the crucial argument I'm also making is that if there is no conscience in Rousseau's paradigm, then also there is the impossibility of a general will that somehow is altruistic and seeks the welfare of the whole. And therefore, it simply is not possible for secularists and atheists and evolutionists to take Rousseau's thought and to consider him the father of their thought and develop a political philosophy that is done within the atheistic and evolutionary paradigm. Because Rousseau is developing his whole paradigm within, a, within the contours of belief in God as the author of the human conscience.